Okay, so today we have the pleasure of having Jonathan James Winnick from the University of Hong Kong, who will tell us about electrolyted behavior in built granular materials. Thank you very much. So first of all, I'd like to thank very much SMRI for the chance to be here. I also like to thank Martin and Robbie for you know being such a good host to me and having so many wonderful scientific collaborations. Really, I'm really impressed by this department. It's my first visit here, and you know I think a very good research culture, very good researchers. I'm very very impressed by by this uh, by this by this place. First of all, I'm going to talk about two little topics in uh, dilute granular material, and the first one was done with my, he used to be my PhD student, but Dong Yu Hui. Uh, he is now in a place called UIC, which is in Zhuhai. And uh, Zhang Chang is my former colleague in, in CDU, but he uh, retired and he also moved to the same university. And uh, this is the outline. I guess not many people know much about granular material, so I'll introduce the uh, problem. I'll also you know, formulate some problem and talk about some numerical results, and then I'm going to find a theoretical way to try and uh, explain some pretty, I think, some pretty surprising behavior. And then we'll talk about how we can use that theory to extract mechanisms and understand something about the physics. Actually, the problem I will talk about is a very simple problem, but nevertheless, the, the mechanics are actually quite complicated. So what is a granular material? The granular material is, according to this, is a from definition, is a conglomerate of discrete solid macro uh, macroscopic particles. So think about sand, for example. That would be you have large numbers of grains of sand. And uh, what is important about these particles, what makes them different from other things like fluids, is that when two sand grains, when two particles collide, the energy, the kinetic energy they bring in is, uh, is more than the kinetic energy that they leave with. So these, uh, during collisions, or in fact, maybe other interactions, but I'm only going to talk about collisions, there's a loss of energy. And that's different from fluids. Two fluid molecules interact with one another. That's a quantum interaction. And okay, for the most part, that conserves energy. In some strange cases, it may not, but anyway. And uh, a granular flow is just rap a rapid movement, or not necessarily rapid, but movement of large numbers of granular particles. Now, uh, you, may, you may not be so familiar with granular materials, but actually in terms of manufacturing and, and uh, the ba basic industry, these are the main items which are used. Almost everything in all factories is either liquids or grains, okay? It's much more easy to deal with. And just give some simple examples. Here's like rice, okay? You may have to move rice underneath the train lines. You need to put these... Uh, stones, which will you know support the train line, stop them from moving. The top right, top left corner, you can see um, piles of sand, and then here people are uh, moving grain around. So, of course, because it's so important in in industry and, um, and so on, and technology, engineers worked very heavily on this problem. And uh, well, it's perhaps not a subject which. You may, at first sight, it may seem very good subject for mathemat mathematicians or physicists, but when you start looking into it carefully, you find a lot of troublesome things which engineers have to deal with. And let me just give you one example. So let's talk about the sand pile. Okay, suppose you, you, ha you have to choose a place, the best place to be buried under a sand pile. Okay, <laughs> where, where will that be? Okay, everyone is going to choose the edge. Okay, because you're obviously you're under less weight and uh yeah and that's correct of course the edge is the best place but where's the worst place okay i think most people would guess it's actually directly in the on the ground directly underneath the um the, the point in the middle in fact that's not correct well it's a little bit it's a little bit troublesome but in general there's a there's a minimum at the uh at the midpoint, and the, and the uh, the worst place is some some place a little bit off the midpoint, and well, there's some cartoon models that people use to explain that, and in fact, it's not that surprising if you understand, if you have a good understanding of solid mechanics. But what's really weird about these problems is what I just told you actually is what happens in most sand piles, but unfortunately, 
the, the stress distribution at the bottom depends on the way that you actually constructed the sand pile. So it somehow depends on the construction history. And this really makes it very difficult to, to you know, really build up any theories. And this is a kind of common problem with, with um, granular materials is that although it looks very simple, actually it can be very, very annoying and difficult. And uh, so these were all kind of, the, the behavior is a little bit like a solid, uh, you know, it's, it's almost static. It's basically dominated by friction, but there's another kind of, uh, another kind of interaction. And when this, so let's just go through what we're looking at here. This was a, um, a hopper, which was filled with some kind of a particulate matter. And unfortunately the hopper uh, broke, there was a, an accident and, uh, the hopper collapsed, and as you can see, there's like this huge flood of uh, particles rushing, uh, rushing out. It kind of looks a little bit like a fluid. Just in the middle, we have a rock avalanche. If you watch this on video, you'll also see it really look, just looks like a river flowing down. And on the, on the far right, we have a snow avalanche, kind of the same thing. It looks like a river, but there's more kind of like uh, uh, dust looking things in, in the, in the, in the um, snow avalanche. But nevertheless, all of these things have some kind of fluid appearance. And what the engineers did, I mean, it seems like a natural thing to do, is they took Navier-Stokes, some kind of Navier-Stokes equations, something related, similar to Navier-Stokes equations, and they put in this energy loss. When two particles collide, they put in the energy loss term and they developed a, a set of continuum equations, kind of looks a bit like Navier-Stokes. And they used those equations and well, whether they're successful or not depends on your point of view. I think engineers had, you know, they still have a lot of fitting parameters. And, you know, some people would say successful, some people would say not successful. And uh, let's take uh, these, these, although they were fast, rapid granular flows, these were still very dense. You know, they're still, the particles are still pretty close together, but Actually, there are other cases where you may want to look at more dilute granular flows. And here what we have is a, is a, a village and uh, looking from above. And those lines, which you can see there, those are actually um, passive protection me measures, which were built by the village. And uh, the idea is that when, if some rocks fall down, a few rocks fall down, or even, even perhaps snow avalanche, that the, um, the, the passive uh, protect the pr passive protection methods will um, you know deflect the uh, deflect the rocks. So you can imagine this is a much more dilute dilute flow. The rocks are hitting this uh, hitting this um, protection measures. And uh, of course, uh, you may think, well, this seems like a pretty simple problem, and yeah, it seems like it should be, but. Unfortunately, when you look at the experiments and you look at the, um, you look at the, uh, well, th there's no real solid theoretical underpinning. Although it looks very simple, in fact, the, the agreement with the simple theories that engineers use actually doesn't really work that well. And this kind of motivates the problem of um, what's the average force that would be experienced by a kind of oblique wall. That's what we're, one of the problems we'll look at today. And uh, what we'll do is we'll try to investigate the system at the particle scale to try and understand the dynamics of that process. Well, before I really continue, I should say that there's been like an enormous amount of work on, on dense granular materials. And this kind of um, engineers were the first people to work on it. And then in the, uh, maybe in the 90s, I think, yeah, uh, early 90s, uh, Kadanoff wrote a, the the guy from you know the the physicist who um, worked on phase transitions. He actually wrote a, a very provocative paper attacking the continuum equations. And um, well, that paper had some subtle, very subtle difficulties, and the model kind of survived. But then people used Kadanoff's ideas, and they claimed that uh, the physicists claimed that. Um, the, part, the, the, the particles would not remain homogeneous. The particles would form these clusters and then the clusters would actually ruin the, um, ruin the, ruin the statistical chaos, which is a fundamental assumption in deriving those Navier-Stokes equations for, from, from kinetic gas theory. And uh, so the physicists claimed that the, the whole model was wrong. 
And then there's a big debate and engineers acknowledge that the clusters form, but I think sometimes they thought, okay, well, the clusters break up and they form, they break up, but it's still kind of okay. So there's a kind of consensus that, yeah, you can use the equations for engineering purposes, but maybe not well, um, full, you know, fully well posed. And that was a kind of um, the, the state, that's the kind of state of granular materials. A lot of controversy, a lot of fighting, but in the end, I think they kind of came to some agreement. But in dilute granular flows, I think there was never much disagreement. I think everyone always thought that dilute granular flows actually are very simple and that because the cl this clustering thing can't happen when it's too dilute, people thought that, okay, this should really be well modeled by the fluid equations. And uh, yeah, I think it's really, people generally believe that these dilute granular flows actually are very simple, either very, very close to fluid mechanics or um, dilute gas theory. Okay, and what I wanna do in this talk is to convince you this is completely not true, even at a very, very basic level. And what I'll try to do is construct two, in this talk, I'll show two examples where I think you can find something for which Problem is very, very simple, but there's no fluid or, or, um, or dilute gas analog. And uh, in fact, I have found many of these things. It's not just these two. Maybe I found seven or, or eight of these things, but um, these two are the ones which I think they're kind of a little surprising to everyone. The other ones you need to know a little bit more about fluid mechanics and shock dynamics and this kind of thing to be able to appreciate why there's a surprise. But I think today's one, because it's for a more general audience, I will, I will mention this. But perhaps the other ones are even more surprising to, to people in fluids. Anyway, let's start with this uh, simple model. So what I'm trying to do is keep everything as simple as possible so that I can isolate the surprising behavior in the most basic system. Okay. A lot of these things I could generalize if I wanted to, it would be robust against those generalizations, but it's not the point of what I'm doing. I'm trying to find something surprising or at least surprising to the engineers, which, um, which is you know, in the simplest possible setting. So what do we have? We're gonna take identical smooth spheres, which uh, uh, they all have the same radius and mass, and I'm gonna fire them at a wall, at a barrier, which has angle theta. I'm gonna, I'm gonna assume that all particles move in the same direction and have the same velocity. I could generalize these, but it just makes everything much, much more troublesome. It's much harder to define a, where you should come from and so on and so forth. Okay, so what happens is the particles, will, when they're far away, they will all come in. They all, there's no collisions because they're all moving at the same speed. Particles will hit the wall, will be rebounded, and then they can hit the incoming particles. Okay, so what could be easier than this? Okay, so what do we have? So there's a spatial distribution for the direction which is perpendicular to the flow. That's uh, shown by that red curve. That will be some density, some probability density. And then there'll also be a, a mean separation between particles. There'll also be a distribution which tells you how far the particles are separated in the along stream direction. Okay, so these are two things that tells you how dense the incoming particle stream is. So I'm going to use, I'm going to measure everything in terms of particle radius. So S will be the separation across how widely separated this distribution is. And V will tell you how separated they are in the um, along stream direction. So just two very simple parameters. Oh, of course, we have the wall angle theta. And then there are also two parameters which tell me uh, it's the coefficient of restitution for particle-particle collision. So particles come in with speed one. If it's a head-on collision, they rebound with speed E. And similarly with the wall, particles hit the wall with speed one, and the perpendicular component is reflected with speed um, uh, EW. Okay, so we have these four, uh, five parameters. Now, there's a numerical method to do this. Maybe, maybe I'll skip. This is not so important. But in fact, because the particles are just moving in straight lines, you can just consider all possible pairs of particles, find the time when they will, will collide, or maybe you have to go backwards in time, and then just find the minimum. And then you that, that will tell you when the first collision occurs. You use the collision rules, conservation momentum, and the, the uh, uh, inelasticity rule to update the velocities. And then I go forward again. And actually, it, numerically, 
people call it exact method. It's a bit, a bit of an exaggeration, but it's true that there's the only error is um, machine error. Okay, just very, very simple. It's a very, very fast. And it, this works very, very well if you are doing elastic particles. Unfortunately, you can get a problem that occurs, which happens when you get an infinite number of collisions occur in a finite time. So three particles and the middle one just keeps bouncing backwards and forwards. And you can never get beyond that part. You can never get beyond that point using this method. So when that happens, you switch to another method, which treats the particles as like soft spheres, a little bit soft, slightly soft, and then just uses potential methods. So this is very inaccurate because I've approximated rigid spheres by soft spheres and also need to solve some ODE system. It's troublesome. And uh, it's, so it's very slow. But for the most part, I'm gonna, this, is, this is only really needed when you go to dense system. It can happen, but it's very unusual. So for the most part, all of the simulations you see will be just seen, done using this method, which basically has no error. So what, do, what are we looking at here? So I'm plotting a graph of the, the wall angle. So remember, 90 degrees is the full-on uh, impact. Zero would be very, very uh, bleak impact. And I've put something called F mean, which is not exactly a force. It's really an impulse Per, uh, a mean impulse per particle okay but because the particles are coming in at a certain rate it's kind of like a, effectively like average force and uh, what do you see so oh i should say that uh, s is the, the the spread remember how how far the how far the particles are spread in the, the uh, transverse direction and v is the uh, longitudinal spread and uh, what you can see is no surprise and this is what the engineers in their models, this is what they have. They say, as you increase the bar barrier angle, you increase the force on the wall. And that totally makes sense, okay? If, if it's, the particle is going like that, it's much softer than if it rebounds off the wall. So no surprise here. And I think that's why engineers think this is a, bo think this is a boring problem. Okay, but, okay, perhaps <laughs> it's a little bit surprising that if I localize the jet, so let's look at the top picture. If I localize the jet, I've now made the spread is five particle diameter, five particle radii. And uh, if, the, if, the v, if the V is relatively small, then you can see it's still monotonic. But if I make the spread a, a little bigger, actually this becomes non-monotonic and you can see there's quite a big drop. The maximum angle is now 70 degrees or 70 something degrees. And then there's a big drop off as you go towards 90. So I think this is something completely um, unknown to engineers. And when I talked to them, they, re they really didn't know this at all. And as you make the, 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 um, the, the stream, the incoming jet more focused, actually you, you get this uh, effect becomes even stronger. And when you make it very, very focused, actually you get a lot of crazy oscillations occur in this um, in this thing and you get big reductions in force as well so what's going on okay well before we do that let's talk about something else that happens so let's look at what happens as you change the coefficient of restitution so again we're pulling mean force against coefficient of restitution and the left upper left angle upper left uh, situation is what normally happens that's when theta is um uh, this is theta is 80 degrees or 84 degrees or something. And normally what happens is as you increase E, you make the particles more elastic, you decrease the mean force. But if you take the angle very close to 90 degrees and have a pretty focused jet, you can actually make it go the other way. Increasing E may increases the force. And there's a small range in which Part of it increases and part, oops, part partially increases and partially decreases. Okay, so very, very surprising. But what's, what's going on here? Okay, so now look, in order to get to the, to, to the bottom of this, let's try and develop a theoretical approach. And uh, what we're going to do is we're going to assume that any given particle can experience at most one particle particle collision. It can hit the wall again, but uh, it cannot hit another particle again. So if two particles, you know, in our theory, if two particles would collide again, we're just gonna ignore that secondary collision. So what that means is there's only really three possibilities. Possibility one is that both particles hit the wall and are reflected. Possibility two is that uh, two particles collide, one of them hits the wall and the other one rebounds. 
Um, but there is another possibility is that the two particles collide and then both particles hit the wall. Okay, so those are the those are the possibilities. It's actually impossible for both particles to uh, not hit the wall. One of them at least must hit the wall again. And maybe I won't go through this in heavy detail, but let me, it's some kind of probabilistic. I mean, you can imagine this is not too difficult. Anyway, what we're going to do is we're going to derive a formula for the probability that a, that a given particle experiences a particle-particle collision. And, uh, and what we'll try and do is derive an exact expression for the, for the mean force on the wall. So let's have some notation. The B, uh, Bj means, the, sorry, Bn means that the nth particle, a Bn represents the nth particle in the stream. Cnj is represents that there's a collision between the nth and the jth particle. Uh, and Dn means uh, Bn has collided with one of the previous particles. So under our assumptions, this Cnj, Cnk is the null set because we don't allow a particle to collide with two other particles if J and K are not equal. And the, of course, this, um, if, it has, if it collides with any of the other particles, it's just the union of the collisions with all the previous particles. So just some very simple notation. And uh, let's see. So, well, I think this is probably so easy that it's not really worth going through in very careful detail. But what we will assume to get the simplest possible formula is that B will only collide with its nearest neighbor. So Bn, the nth particle, can only collide with n minus one particle, n plus one particle. If it's dilute enough, that actually will be a good assumption. And uh, in this case, yeah, basically, I, I won't go through it in careful detail, but you can work out just using Bayes' rule, you can derive a formula for what's the probability a single particle collides with its nearest neighbor if once you've reached a steady state. And uh, then what do you do? So then all, now we've found this probability. So now we just have to look at the, um, uh, given these probabilities, we have to work out what are the uh, forces associated with each um, pair of uh, input uh, heights. Okay, so if you if you put the particles at certain heights, uh, what happens? So in, in this in the in the left leftmost case, there's no interaction. Just get a simple no interaction between the particles, and, and so the particles just hit the wall, and we get this wall impulse. But uh, in the second case, for this particular particular choice of uh, z uh, inputs height inputs, you get a collision between the particles. And then we'll get another uh, F, FCW. FW is just the wall. FCW is uh, a collision, the a collision with the wall after a particle particle collision. And then the top one, we see we have to include both uh, collision uh, components. So again, we can just use the formula to do that. Uh, it's, it's a relatively simple formula, just working out when things collide with each other. And in fact, it's possible. So that was the theory for nearest neighbor, only nearest neighbors collide. But in fact, it's possible if you want, you could put in the next two, you could put the nearest two neighbors and develop some similar theory. And the formulas just become more complicated and you could do it with three particles and four particles, but actually it's not in the spirit of what we're trying to do. The spirit of what we're trying to do, we're just trying to understand the mechanic. The mechanics. So we're only gonna focus on the nearest neighbor collisions. Okay, so let's just summarize uh, ideas. So in this theoretical derivation, we consider interaction with nearest neighboring particles, and then by analyzing the pair, uh, uh, pairwise particle-particle collisions, we can obtain a formula which basically gives you the mean force. So there are two parts. Um, there are two parts. Uh, Fb is just the direct impact with the wall, and then this Fp, uh, tells you, given the two input heights, Z1 and Z2, Fp somehow gives you the, um, uh, the force which those two particles will, um, will, imp will, impart on it, will impart on the wall, and the rho just represents the probability density or the joint distribution density of the two initial heights of the particle. So we just have some simple um, integral to evaluate. 
And in fact, I could do this with a uniform distribution. You get a very simple formula, but I think perhaps it's more natural to use the uh, Gaussian distribution as the input for the, uh, for the two part for the particles. So particles are independent and they, uh, so rho Z1, Z2 is just two Gaussians. And you get this horrible formula, okay? You get this very, really long formula. I'm not gonna go through it in detail, but it's, it's not particularly, uh, it's not particularly beautiful or nice. And you can see that parameters appear in these C minus and D minus, which depend on V and S and stuff like that. And uh, well, you might think that's the end of it, but the good thing about this thing is that we can associate each term with a certain kind of behavior, certain kind of mechanics. And by, by looking carefully at these terms, we can work out when, the, when, the, uh, when these different phenomena occur, and we can go back to what were the mechanics, and we can, um, we can uh, work out what the mechanism is. Okay. So before we go any further, let's look at the validity of this. Okay. So let's take a, a, a very low angle, theta equals 20, and uh, we'll take the spread is about five. And as you can see, when the particles are separated by a long way in the, in the long stream direction, the, the agreement is very good. And it's still okay, I guess, when you go down to about five. So uh, when the angle is, is uh, oblique, then it's actually pretty good. When the angle becomes bigger, as you can see, it gets harder and harder to, um, to get really good agreement. But still we have, like a bit of a range over which it's um, it's uh, agreeing, and in fact, the I should say the blue is blue is theoretical, red is the numerical one. So if I was obviously I go to infinite v, then they never will have any interactions. You, yeah, you guarantee it will work. Correct, exactly. Uh, but this this is actually a very harsh test. Okay, perhaps I shouldn't test myself so so aggressively. Here's a more reasonable test. Uh, also still a pretty harsh test, which is uh, S is one, V is three. So it's not very dilute. And you can see that when the angle is low, it's very good. And then as you go to higher and higher angles, well, it starts to fail. And what I'm plotting on the right is uh, the particle-particle collision probability against theta. So what we have is the, um, let's see, the red one is the, um, is the actual, uh, the actual, uh, sorry, is the theoretical, no, no, the red one is the, the, is the theoretical prediction for how many particle-particle um, particle collisions you'll get. The blue one is the numerical one for, for one particle-particle particle collision. So it doesn't agree very well once you go beyond here. And then the dotted one is actually the, um, how many multiple particle collisions. That's two part, part, particles which happen, a particle collides with more than one particle. So this definitely is a failure. But again, this is uh, a very harsh test. So now let's go to a case where it works very well. Okay, so let's look at this. So what we have here is a very narrow jet. S is 0 0.1 and pretty well separated. V equals 20. Okay, now because it's so, um, because it's, the jet is so narrow, what happens is if you have a small angle, it's, there's definitely no collision. You can see that here. The probability of a particle-particle collision is basically zero. And that, uh, that far goes all the way up to about 80 degrees. And then when we reach 80 degrees, you can see uh, now we have very good agreement, both the theoretical and the um, numerical results agreeing very, very well for one particle-particle collision. And that, captures this drop and an increase. And it's only here, very, very close to um, 90 degrees where you start to see many, many multiple particle collisions. And that's the place only there where the theory starts to deviate. So this is the first few cases I showed you actually are really kind of against me, working against me. And this is one where the, the parameters really work in my favor and we're able to capture this uh, mechanics very clearly. And here's a more, a more realistic one. This is not, not so spread out. And basically you get, the same, you get the same thing. You get the decrease. And it's only in this last 10, 10 degrees or so where we, theory starts to fail. But over big parts of the regime, we can still capture the mechanics. Okay. 
And so how do we explain this? Well, what we do is we break, the, um, we break this, um, this force, the mean force, into uh, two, two products, uh, the uh, Fg and Fs. And Fg is a very, very simple effect. It's just the fact that you have this geometric effect, which is that particle comes in and then it just rebounds with, um, it rebounds, uh, you know, according to the angle, <laughs> the sine theta. So when theta is 90, you get a full rebound. When theta is small, you'll get a very acute rebound. So that's the Fg is a very simple thing. And then we have Fs, which is this integral here. And uh, basically, the larger the deflector, the, a large deflector angle implies a large velocity component perpendicular to the wall. And, uh, and uh, that will take care of the geometric effect. That will take care of this dotted line. So that would just be the very simple um, theory. And then this Fs is actually allowing me to, to take this drop off closer to 90 degree, closer to the 90 degree angle. And let this thing, well, I, you can look at it very carefully, but in fact, it's like, uh, we'll call this like a kind of shielding effect. So how does this work? Let, let me take the simplest possible example. So the wall is, we're going to put 90 degree wall. We're going to fire two particles at the wall and uh, they're going to bounce back with the with, uh, uh, speed one. So no energy loss. So in, the, in, the, in the, the worst case you can get is this particle comes in with speed one, rebounds with speed one. And so the part that gives us, that gives me a, or speed V zero, that gives me an impulse of two V zero. And then this one does the same and another two V zero, so the net impulse is four V zero. Now the best possible case is what happens here. This particle comes in, rebounds, hits there, that's two V zero. The second particle comes in, hits the first particle at a 45 degree angle, and then they both go off parallel to the wall, and there's, they do not hit the wall again. So the net impulse is basically two V zero. So this shielding effect at best, can halve your, can halve, uh, can halve the, um, halve the overall um, thing. And uh, in fact, that, that shielding effect, the, you can go into it in more details, but I don't really want to do that. I haven't really got time, but that shielding effect exactly explains this behavior. And we also looked at this, remember we saw this at the beginning. Sometimes you get the force decreases with uh, coefficient of restitution, sometimes increases, sometimes it's non-monotonic. So why is that? Well, maybe I'll go to the next figure. Yeah, let's, I'm gonna split the, I'm gonna split the, I've rotated the frame and now I'm consider particles which are coming downwards. This fits better into the frame. And uh, so what's happened here, the first particle has come down, hit the wall and has now bounced back. And I'm gonna call, a glancing collision is a collision where the first particle goes off and the second particle hits the wall. Uh, it's deflected slightly, but hits the wall. And I'm going to call like a head-on collision is when the first particle comes down, hits the second particle, and then the first particle goes back. Now, what does, what does, in, let me come over here. What does increasing the, what does increasing the, um, coefficient of restitution do? It makes both particles bounce back faster. Okay, so you can kind of see in the top case, larger coefficient of restitution means the second particle will bounce back slightly more away from the wall, the larger the coefficient of restitution is. And that means for glancing collisions, increasing E will decrease the force. On the other hand, for head-on collisions, this one comes back if I make E larger, Particle one will bounce back more, more aggressively and will increase the force. So that's why uh, your glancing collisions have this effect, head on collisions have this effect. And it depends whether you get which, which of these two behaviors you get depends is the system dominated by head on collisions or is it dominated by glancing collisions? So if the system is wide, if the spread is wide, then you get many more. Uh, glancing collisions, and so you normally get this top left corner. But uh, if you make it, uh, um, um, 
uh, more narrowly uh, focused, like, like this one here, then it's possible that you can get, uh, you can get um, the opposite way around. This one is dominated by, this is dominated by head-on collisions. So that basically explains these, uh, these things. So what would have, I, I could go into ma many more details, but I think these are the, perhaps the most natural things to discuss. So what have we done? We've taken a very simple system, particles are pl uh, colliding with an obl oblique wall, and uh, we've shown that you get this surprising behavior. And by developing this pretty simple theory, we've been able to see how these uh, geometric effects and shielding effects can compete with each other under what circumstances they do that and how you can get these weird behaviors in terms of the force on the, uh, on the wall. And so we've managed to, uh, we've managed to develop a few, um, a few uh, ideas from here. And let me talk about another problem. So this was a, prob a problem which I did, again, the same colleague, uh, Kiang Zhang, who used to be my, my uh, colleague. And these were two students, uh, two PhD students I worked with, uh, Yuan Fang and uh, Gao Ming. They both now work in finance. And this is, again, a very simple question. Particles, ide identical uh, rigid particles are dropped into a hopper from the top. The particles fall under gravity. And how long do the particles stay in this system? Again, a very simple problem. I'm going to make it even simpler. Okay, that one is already too complicated. Let's make it even simpler. What happens if you just do it with a single particle? Okay, what could be easier than this? Okay, the particle falls down, hits the wall, there's a coefficient of restitution, bounces back, and goes out the hole. How long does it take for a particle to go through the hole? Well, let's choose coefficient of restitution pretty small, 0 0.3. And what do you see? Well, if the angle is 90 degrees, is like that, then of course the particles just fall straight through. It's very, very quick. If the angle is like 10 degrees, okay, then it's going to bounce a lot and going to take much longer. And it's a mon so it's a monotonic decreasing function of theta. And I think who would imagine that anything else could possibly happen? It's imp impossible, right? But even with a very small coefficient of restitution, you maybe see this little bit of a strange bump here. Okay, so what's going on here? Well, Let's make E, put E in the realistic range, and you start to see, oh, this is not simple at all. We've got a lot of crazy oscillations. And uh, let's make E ridiculously elastic. Okay, and now we can see, oh, it's totally strange. And let's make the, you know, the totally unrealistic assumption that E is equal to one. And now we can see we have these huge resonance times here, 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 and here. So let's take a look. Let's take a look at what happens when I, when I'm at 45 degrees and 46 degrees. Okay, so this is very easy. We can just look at these two cases. Let's start with 45 degrees, top left corner. So what am I plotting? X is the input location. That's where I drop the particle. And on the vertical axis, I'm plotting how long it takes before it goes out. So obviously, if X is zero, the particle will just fall straight down and the, the time will be very short. But if X is different, then you know, maybe the particle bounces around a bit and then goes out. So what you see in the top figure, when theta was 45, you can see you do get some particles which stay there a long time, but they're very isolated. But when theta is 46, you can see, oh, you get these huge areas of um, huge regions of par particles which apparently stay in the system for a very long time. And um, that basically explains it, right? Because if I integrate over this, of course, I have a much longer uh, period. But why? Why is this happening? Let's look at some sample trajectories. So these two are 45 degrees, different X, X inputs. The particle comes in, bounces around, and then goes out. But what's strange is that when you're in the 46 degrees, the particle comes down, bounces across, goes across, hits there, and then basically reverses that, that pattern and then just keeps doing that for a long, long time before eventually it will, it will just drift out. And here's another possible one. This one's more simple. It comes down, hits here, goes back, well, like that. 
Okay, so, uh, and then we can do the same thing. I'm not gonna go through in detail, but here's another one of these two things. And this one's a little, even simpler. Again, we have the same kind of behavior, same kind of behavior. So what we can do is we can set up a map which takes me from the place where I dropped the particle. Oh, I'm sorry. First of all, let's choose the simplest possible periodic orbit. That's one I drop, it hits the wall, hits this wall, bounces back and goes up and just repeats like that. Okay. And then we can do that. You can obviously solve that. It's a very simple system to solve. And uh, yeah, we can do that. Here's the, here's the solution doesn't mean much. And now what we can do is we can just slightly perturb this, uh, we can slightly perturb this solution. And then what happens is you get a kind of map which takes you from the, orig the original collision point to the you know, one, two, three, the, th the third collision point. And then from then onwards, it third collision point should be the same as the zeroth one. And then we can just, within, this is gives me a map the, you know, this would be the fixed point at where third collision point is the same as the, 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 the initial collision point. That gives me just a simple map and I can write it, I can linearize it and I can find the eigenvalues. And what we find is this. So here, this is plotted against theta and this is the real part of the eigenvalues. And what you see is uh, for theta less than 45, we've got one eigenvalue, which is modulus bigger than one. And the same thing when theta is bigger than 50 something, but between 45 and 50 something, we have this place where we have uh, eigenvalues which are complex, but have um, modulus one. So that in some sense means mutually stable. And it turns out that those air, to, to, find, the, to find the region where, where this orbit is stable, you just have to, <laughs> some weird calculation, but, you just have to find where this thing is less than two, just some simple algebra involving the determinant and so on and so forth. And then we get the exact range in which this is, in which this is stable. R cars of root something minus root something. Okay. And then that turns out to be 45 degrees to 50.97 degrees exactly coincides with the, the place where we find this orbits which last a long time. And I've just done this for this particular orbit, this one, but that you can just find there are many orbits and you can put them, you can just do the same thing and you can work out these ranges and I've plotted them here on the figure. And you can see, it tells you exactly where, the, where these uh, resonances occur. So the, yeah, do, do the orbits exist? Yeah, so you, there, there's some condition which, it depends how big, it's a little complicated because it depends how big the hole is. So there's some conditions, but usually I assume I take the hole relatively small, not the point. So yeah, you have to, you have, there's a condition on existence, but the thing that's making the difference between, uh, between the, the, the swap over is usually, usually um, stability. So these, these things were all, all these red things with the result of stability calculations. For some reason, the existence seems not to be, not to be so important. So what have we done? We've shown that a um, single inelastic particle falling through a hopper is much, you would imagine it's very, very simple, but in fact, it's completely non-trivial. Okay? Small e, the residence, the residence time has a very intuitive behavior, but as you get larger and larger e, you get this weird um, little region, narrow regions in which the um, get these very long times. And again, we've got an analytical theory where we can predict this anomalous behavior. And uh, yeah, basically that's the main takeaway from this topic. And uh, I wanna say that both of these two things, there's no analogy in, in classical fluid mechanics or even dilute gas theory okay? for various reasons. And as I said before, actually I have many of these, I found many of these types of behavior, like maybe seven or so, seven or eight. And uh, but these are, the, these are the ones which I think are just the most, you know, for a general math audience, the tools you need are, are very limited, just high school mathematics. And the other ones you need to know more about fluid mechanics, you need to know more about shock dynamics and stuff like that. But I think these what I selected these two for this reason. Even though in some sense, these are not the most surprising of, of the ones that I found. So let me, uh, 
let me finish here and thank everyone for your attention. <laughs> That's right. I didn't mention that. I was a little bit too quick, but you need to choose a distribution across the top of the um, across the top of the domain. And so, let's see. If I choose something like this, then I need to I need to average I need to average this over a certain distribution of particle inputs, and I need to average this. But you know, whatever you do, basically, you will, this one will still be much larger than this one. So. Or what's going on in, in this? Yeah, what's the structure? Yeah, no, no, this is averaged. There's some weird thing where I think here there's one orbit, and then inside here somewhere there's another orbit which coincide another kind of orbit which coincides uh, with that. Forget exactly the details. I think so. All of these, all of these places where it's red, the eigenvalues are. That there is an orbit where the eigenvalues have modulus one and a complex. Yeah, so for this, for the particular orbit I showed you, here the, the eigenvalue is bigger than one. Here it's going around the unit circle, and here it changes. But there are other orbits because of the end. Yeah, there's a conservation. Yeah, exactly. If I were to like plot lambda, there would be a pair of the orbit around the unit circle. I, I don't think so. I think that if you started like theta is 30, I think that would correspond to this, these two points, I guess. And then that, then those two, as you increase those two come together, that could correspond to 45 and then like this, and then they separate and these would correspond to, I, I believe so. Yeah, I believe so. So the, this is just for one type of orbit. So, but so there's this kind of orbit, which is the simplest one. And then there's another, here's another orbit, which is, you know, it's got one, two, three, four collisions. So there's a bunch of them. You have to do it for each orbit. I think what happens is you do the first few, and then after that, it just becomes so small, the regions become so small, or they just don't, ex they just don't exist at all, that it's, it's not such a big deal. So I think we did... I don't remember how many. Let me have a look. One, two, three, four, five. And I think there's a few others which are embedded in the other ones. So maybe we looked at maybe 10 orbits, but I think six of them will, uh, will basically more or less give you the whole picture. But the theories of the library was minus. You know, period. Yeah. Before the other one. But if it would first come together at last one, then it goes around the circle. Minus one of them. Then it goes back up in the voice period. That will be within the edge of But these are neutrally stable, right? In the because of there's a conservation rule. Yeah. yeah. But still the minus one is still expected as the edge of the second Okay. I haven't looked at that. Yeah, that's a good uh, that's a good point. It's a bit surprising that you have one orbit which impacts the entire dynamic duration, average duration. If you take an issue condition very far away, because because they're they are neutrally stable, so that's why you. In fact, you can kind of even see it to some extent. Is it this one? Yeah, like this one. This is this is the simplest orbit. So you can see, even if I start far away from that orbit, it still um, it still stays. It still just moves around that orbit somehow. So. I mean, what I can So to describe what is in the main issue is like, it's just like a one relation to the other. Yeah. And yeah. you show it to the American, it felt like an air. You have to, that's where the air really starts. So exactly. Exactly. So, would there be a way, I mean, instead of having a plane, I don't make you focus in or defocus, basically, like that the board, which was then you can control it as well. I don't know, or focus. And then we'd say like, if you want to build an avalanche, you flank mm. the you know, like then. Yeah, I think that's that's exactly right. Yeah, that's exactly right. Because yeah. then basically you're showing that then you don't have to Exactly, and exactly. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. Yeah. And because in, in this theory, what we want is collisions. Collisions in, improve the shielding effect. So yeah, that, that's completely clear. And this thing's a scooter again. Thank you. Yeah.